Welcome to Precious Testimonies. I'm Norm Rasmussen, your host. It's a privilege and an honor to come into the privacy of your home again, letting the Holy Spirit speak through the individual who's going to be sharing his testimony. We have an individual by the name of Rick Lopez. He's going to be sharing at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, the Holland chapter, he's going to be sharing some of the things that God has done in his life. And it's our prayer that the Holy Spirit will speak through him a special blessing just for you. Let's listen now to what uh, Brother Rick has to share with us, okay? Here, I'm privileged that, uh, that you invited me. And uh, I think maybe... Uh, Sometimes you ought to flip it around and have the speaker do go first because, you know, after a good meal and it gets warmed up, I mean, i got to really be good to keep you guys away. <laughs> but uh, I just love the Lord. I come to share uh, my testimony with you tonight, uh, sing a couple songs. If you know the songs, hey, I want you to sing with me. Uh, enjoy yourself in the Lord. What I do a lot of times is... Uh, I just end up closing my eyes and worshiping God and trying to have a good time in the Lord. And I just have this feeling, though, if you join with me, your advantage. If you don't, I don't know, because I got my eyes closed and I'm having a good time in the Lord. Okay, so. My life is in you, Lord, and my
I just pray, Lord, right now that for your anointing, God. I just pray, God, that uh, every word spoken be formed by you. That you use this clay vessel, Lord, for your purpose. And these lips, God, to, to give your word and to do it wisely. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Is that all right? Yeah. I was reminded of a humorous story when I saw this Toys R Us thing up here. A minister came in, and I can sympathize and relate to this completely because I have two daughters. I live here in Holland. Uh, a beautiful wife, uh, two lovely daughters, four and six, Emily and Erica. And this minister once said he can't wait until he has a son or until his daughter grows up and provides him with a grandson because he just wants to go down the other side of Toys R Us. <laughs> Same here, you know, it's always that one pink trip. You know, we're looking for that blue trip right back up the other side someday. Well, I uh, wanted to share a little bit about my life. That's what I'm here for. Uh, might share another song with you or two. And uh, I was, uh, Born again when I was eight years old. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, I did a study one time on testimonies, and I hope you move that camera good because I don't like to stand in one spot. <laughs> <laughs> Give Norm his first challenge. That a lot of people, when they share their testimony, there seems to be a little of God in it, and an awful lot of the troubles and the trials and the yuck. How many have had yuck in your life? Okay. You know, and then when we share our testimony with people, you know, we just, boy, we just tell all that yuck, and there at the end, and God saved me. You know, and there's not a whole lot about God, it seems like. So, in knowing that God was leading me to start sharing my testimony, I began to look into that and want to know, how could I make sure that God is throughout all that yuck? Well, that's sometimes a challenge because to tell you what, we can't see God when we're in the yuck, can we? Right. So I looked back on it and I realized a lot about my life that is really making a difference for me today. Like I said, I was born again when I was eight years old. And uh, my father was a minister uh, in the Church of God. And we traveled a lot. It's one of those churches, you know, where they voted the preacher in and out, you know. Well, I don't, I don't want to look back on it now and I go, well, wait a minute, we moved a lot. So he must have got voted out a lot. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, we moved around a lot. And, uh, you know, I realized that I had the call of God on my life when I was 16 years old. And so I had, uh, you know, held a few youth revivals and ministered in churches from the time that I, I was 16 to 18 years of age. And then probably like a, a lot of us, you know, we get to that age where we're no longer under the, you live under my roof, you do it my way rule, that you finally decide you're gonna do it your way. And that's what I did. I moved on at 18, I left home, and almost immediately I fell into Satan's lie about drugs uh, and all the other things that go with that. Having always been sheltered in my life <coughs> and, and not ever seen any of the world, I. Uh, it was suddenly like a, an amazement to me. It was a wonderment, all this, all this fun stuff out there. All right, now anybody that tells you they did not have fun while they were living a life of sin is telling you a lie, okay? It, how many of you know, it, it was a fun life. This is a better life, isn't it? If it wasn't a fun life, you wouldn't have been doing it, okay? But anyway, you know, I saw all that stuff and I was like, kid in a candy store, man, just give me this, give me that. I want every piece of candy there is to have. And uh, I spent the next 14 years of my life uh, leading a life of uh, an addicted life. Uh, whether it was an addiction to drugs, whether it was an uh, addiction to many of the other lusts of the flesh, even addiction to God in that interim where I raced back and forth from one good thing to the next. Uh, you know, the life of an addict is that of a sprinter. We're not endurance runners. And a sprinter, you know, he goes just as fast as he can, as hard as he can to a specific goal, boy, and then when he's done, he's done. <sighs> you know, those endurance runners, man, they just keep on the truck, you know. They just go on and on and on. Well, I praise God that I'm no longer, I'm addicted to Jesus Christ now, and that's an addiction that says that it's a biblical thing to have. 
But, uh, you know, I went between God and drugs and all other sins that, that accompany that addiction. Uh, two times I nearly overdosed from drugs. I'm going to tell you a story of one of those uh, in a minute. You know, I, I, I wondered when I came here, I, you know, I only met Roy one other time and I had never been to one of these meetings and I thought, oh man, what's it going to be like, you know? Probably a bunch of straight-laced people, you know, sitting there, businessmen's association type of thing. You know. <laughs> but I can see you all are a pretty loose group and you've probably walked the same block that I have. So, uh, but during all this time that I was living this life, I was tormented. Because I had been not only fed the Word of God, but had ministered and preached the Word of God. And so every single night that I went to bed, and this is honest to goodness truth, every single night that, that I went to bed, I would pray, don't come back tonight, God. Because I knew. You know, the Bible told me that uh, in Thessalonians, that you know yourselves that he will come as a thief in the night. It's night. <laughs> Don't come tonight, God, please. And, you know, ha having that torment, you know, it also tells us that where much is known, there's a responsibility to much. And so I was, you know, I was really pretty ticked off at my father for making me know so much about God. Because, I, you know, even though I had fun while I was doing the sin, you know, but afterwards there was a lot of afterthought. Oh, boy, if you come now, man, I'm cooked. So... <laughs> But during those times, you know, that I did return to God, I'd continue to smoke pot. Well, come on. You know, the Bible does say in Genesis that every green herb bearing seed is meat for men. You know. So I thought, hey, you know, I found me a reason in the Bible as to why I could smoke marijuana. It's a green herb, does bear seed. Yes. And in fact, I found that I often witnessed to my smoking buddies while I was smoking pot. Oh, I had awesome times before the Lord after a joint. You know, the Bible does tell us that Satan comes to us as an angel of light. But it also tells us that he's the father of lies. And boy, I was completely tricked by that lie. Really thought that marijuana had a part in my life. And then I came across a verse in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. It says, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with your mind. Uh-oh. I got to do it with all my mind too. Well, I hadn't done anything with all my mind for quite a few years. You know, this was a new thing for me. Suddenly, I have to use my mind too. Well, the one thing that I did realize, though, is that this activity of sitting with my buddies and you know telling them about Jesus and passing the joint, you know, you know. <laughs> Oh, by the way, did you know that that's, that that's the part of the human anatomy most, smoking, most spoken by pot smokers? Ear. Ear. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, do you know about Jesus? <laughs> I mean, what a lie. But you know what I found out is I never changed any one of their lives. They always changed mine. My life always seemed to fall back into the blackness of, of drugs and the sins that accompanied it. Never did I change one of their lives. There was a song, every, and I've told this to many ministers, I'm like, look at me, I can't believe you did this. But all the time that I was getting high, man, I love to play music by the Imperials. I mean, I really dug the Imperials. I mean, they had the greatest guitar notes, man. Chord progressions were just great. And we get high, man, and they'd love to hear me play, and I'd play Imperial tunes. I mean, we, you know, we had some pretty weird uh, smoking parties where we get high and sing imperial tunes. But there was one song in particular that uh, I sang a lot. And, you know, it never really had any meaning to me. And right after I got saved, and I'll get to that uh, in a minute there, uh, I was invited to, to sing in a church. And I decided to sing this song. And for the first time, I understood what I was singing. Uh -huh. And I think I understood something about God at that time. Um, and, and I'm just following the Holy Spirit here. I actually had, the, had it here, but didn't know that I was going to sing it at this point. But I'd like to sing this song to you now. It's called, Whenever I Speak His Name. <laughs> i 
singing that song, but boy, the first time I sang that and the anointing came down, I suddenly realized, began to realize who I was in God and what a relationship with God is all about. And I'll tell you in, a, in, a, in just a couple minutes about how that relationship uh, came to be. The one thing that was for sure was uh, there was never a doubt through all my life that God wanted me for a purpose from the very beginning. Like I said, even every night praying, don't come tonight. I knew that God had a call on my life. Even during my sinfulness, he would call me, and there was a lot of times that he protected me too. There's one such occasion where I nearly died taking some mushrooms, in fact. Um, I really dug mushrooms. I mean, that was, you know, it wasn't a chemical, you know, it was made by God, okay, you know? However, how many know where mushrooms grow? <coughs> if you don't know, they grow in uh, what the cattle leave behind. Uh, so, you know, we, I, I guess you get the picture, okay? I didn't want to get too visual or illustrative with that. Uh, 
so you know sin really brings you down I mean if you're going to eat the fruit of the cattle so to speak you got to be pretty low well granted we'd take them home and clean them off as good as we could and you know saute them in some butter put them in a little cheese and mushroom omelet you know before, before it was gone the plates were purple everything was really going good but and we'd go out a lot okay me and these guys we were in the military in fact and uh, we'd go out every morning, man, and shrooming, and we'd get grocery bags full of mushrooms, and we'd bring them back, and there was three of us guys living in this house, and we had this laundry room. How many know that guys don't do laundry? So we hung up mushrooms in the laundry room. It was just all over the place, dried mushrooms everywhere. You know, the party, we walked through the kitchen, grabbed the beer into the laundry room, grabbed the mushroom, and go back out and party. And so that was just kind of a way of life uh, for a long time, tripping constantly many out-of-body experiences and hallucinations. There was one particular occasion, however, where myself and a, and a friend decided we wanted to, uh, to have a trip. Understand this is a very planned event. Uh, I mean, you know, you pull all your best Pink Floyd albums out the night before, you know. <laughs> You get the candles all set. And I had a real problem, okay? When I got really, really high, I could not stand to see dirt. So I'd be, man, I mean, the plan, I'm talking about plan. I mean, I'd be vacuuming the night before. I'm going to get high tomorrow. You know, I was going to have a really good time. I mean, I took this seriously. I figured out that I was going to be the proverbial old man sitting on my front porch with my guitar in one hand, an Imperial's book, and a bag of weed. I thought that was going to be me. God had a different plan for my life. <laughs> Praise him. Yeah. Well, anyway, we went out, and this time there weren't bags and bags of mushrooms out there. We found six mushrooms. They were beautiful. They were the most beautiful mushrooms that we had ever found. I mean, these puppies were, you know, great big mushrooms. And they were beautiful. And I just tell you the story as I recall the story. Okay, I'm not going, they were awful mushrooms, but I picked them and ate them anyway. <laughs> they were good. And, you know, we chopped off the stems, you know, and we had tea. So we had our breakfast and our tea, mushroom tea. And we began to hallucinate before the last bite was gone. And like I say, we had everything planned. You know, all the shades were drawn, you know, dark candles, Pink Floyd. Now, I had these great big speakers. How many know that great big speakers are the best kind? <laughs> Especially if they're homemade and, uh, out of plywood and they're about this big around, okay? <laughs> big speakers, Pink Floyd, going to town. Well, my partner was gone. I mean, he, he was there, but he was gone. He was on the couch. <laughs> I don't know where he was. But he wasn't saying much. And so I was just listening to Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, sitting on the floor. And my great big gray speakers began to melt, <coughs> literally melt into the floor. And I was really hoping when I came down they'd be there, because I liked those speakers. But anyway, something began to happen to me. And usually what happens when you're on that type of trip, you know, you can, boy, you can just, you can change it, you know. If it starts going bad, if the, if the hallucination is not what you like, you want to change your trip, you want to have a better time, you can change it. It's just a matter of, of controlling your thought. Well, this one particular time, I, I, I couldn't change it. And I was sitting in the floor, and all of a sudden, everything in the room started going like this. I mean, it wasn't waving at me, but it didn't have little hands waving at me, but it was just, everything was going up and down. What I realized is, was that the muscles of my eyes had gone involuntary, and they were bouncing up and down. And, you know, I'd shake my head and try to get myself cleared up, and they were still bouncing up and down. And I began to be concerned that they were bouncing up and down, and I couldn't stop them from bouncing up and down. I mean, this was a new thing for me. And uh, I began to think, I'm going to die. And I thought, I'm in the military. I need to go to the hospital. But wait, I'm in the military. If I go to the hospital, they're going to kill me. If I don't go to the hospital, I'm going to die. It wasn't a very good feeling because I thought I'm dead either way I go, okay? And while I was sitting on the floor there, I went into what's called an out-of-body experience. And I hope this doesn't sound confusing, but the, what happened was I left my body and went up to a higher elevated position within the room and looked down on me. Are you with me? And the me that was up there was straight. He was cool. 
And the guy, the me that was down here was not, okay. What I saw from up there, is this first person, second person, third person? I don't know. What am I talking here? I'm not sure. But in any case, it was like uh, I was down here in a fetal position on the floor. And what I saw, what the me up there saw looking down was on each side of me a figure, one light and one dark. And they were literally arguing over my life that day. Well, the me up there was very aware, very cognizant of what was going on and, and knew the Word of God and, and knew what was happening. The me down here had no control and was totally in a fetal position and was fearful of death and, and, and knew that this battle was going on. What happened was suddenly, it was, and, and this is the honest to goodness truth, the trailer of my door, the door of my trailer flew open and the Louisiana Sun, I was served the Air Force in Louisiana, the Louisiana Sun came busting in there. Or so I thought it was the Louisiana Sun anyway. It was so bright that it blinded us, both of us, just snapped too, just like that, completely sober, completely straight. And my life was changed because I knew that God had changed my life, that God had spared me. However, the life of an addict didn't say, I think I'll quit doing mushrooms. It said, only five next time, not six. That's how far down a person goes when they're involved in that. I'm like a lot of those people who've backslidden many times in that 14 years. Even that time, I went back to God. And it was a very short-lived thing. And over and over and over again, I would, I would backslide against God. And having a knowledge of God, I just knew that I was hurting him in a tremendous way. And even the scripture tells us in, in Hebrews, for it is impossible for those who, who were once enlightened and having tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and tasted the good word of God. I mean, that was me. To... Uh, and the powers of the world to come if they should fall away to renew them again to repentance and I knew what that verse meant I made it impossible for me to return to God because I could not hurt him one more time it was near impossible for me to return to God needless to say that did happen we're going to skip a few years and I'm just going to tell you what happened next basically was I met my wife Diane and I was playing at a Mountain Jacks uh, in Lansing, Michigan and uh, she came in with another friend of hers. And uh, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you there was love at first sight. Because Diane was, uh, was a professed alcoholic. I was a professed druggie. Now, tell me if this isn't God. I hated alcohol. She hated drugs. And we fell in love. You would think, boy, that's got to be pure hell from the beginning, you know. <laughs> but it wasn't. It changed, it began a change in my life. And all of my life, I had made a commitment that uh, if I ever had children, I, I didn't want them brought up in a world of drugs. That I was going to have to change my life. That I was going to have to make something different happen because I didn't want that to happen to them. And shortly after Diane and I uh, were, were married, uh, God gave us a little Emily. And uh, that catapulted my desire to be free from drugs. It catapulted my desire to be with God again. But having destroyed my relationship with God so many times, I felt like this time I want to do it right. This time I'm not going to come to God out of a desperate act. I'll get myself together. I'll pull myself together, I'll get myself free of drugs, and I'll come to God clear-eyed, cleared conscience, and make an attach attachment with Him based on desire and not desperation. What a lie. What a lie. You know, even the thief on the cross certainly came to Him out of a point of desperation at that moment, didn't he? And well, I tried to go free from drugs on my own, and it, you know, I thought—I mean, I thought my life was pretty well together. I never got in trouble. I never uh, spent any time in jail. Uh, you know, I was the all-American boy. I always had short hair because I was in the military, and I mean, I just—no one would—no one would have ever known. Okay, I mean, I had a relatively stable life. I was quite successful in the military, and uh, 
but when I quit doing drugs, suddenly the balance in my life went away because the thing that kept the bubble straight now shifted and the bubble began to move around me. The one thing that held my life together was not there anymore and I began to fall apart. And after a few weeks of struggling and trying, I tell you what, I used to walk down to uh, the church on the corner and I'd walk around the church as they were having church. Not ready to change my life, I'd ha I had my, had my long beard and, and long hair and I'd wear a, a, a fatigue jacket and a fatigue hat and I was just, uh, I was just going to be mean and gruff, you know. I was going to go to God but not go to God. You know, it's like I felt that there was safety there but I'm not going to give myself to him. So I'd walk around the building thinking this is okay, there's safety in this block. I will be okay tonight. And if that didn't feel good enough, I'd sit on the steps because the closer I got to the building, the closer I got to God. And I just hoped someday somebody would come say, you, you okay, young man? Can I help you? You know, But that never happened. In fact, I remember that I went to a church one time, Assembly of God, in fact, uh, here in Holland, Michigan, and uh, they were having a prayer meeting night. I didn't know it was a prayer meeting night. It's just that they, the doors were open. I said, you guys are having church? They said, yes. Yeah. So I went in. I sat right in the very back. They prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. And I thought, well, this prayer's got to be over some soon. <laughs> but they never quit praying. They just kept on. Saying, well, this is cool. Let them pray. I'm safe here. And some guy got up from the very front. He was kneeled down the very front, walked all the way to the back, put his hand on my shoulder, and I looked at him like I was going to bite it off. <laughs> and he said to me, whatever your problem is, God can help you. And he turned and walked off. That really meant a lot to me. I don't know who that guy is to this day. But he basically reminded me of what I knew already. So I decided I needed to get some help, so I went to Narcotics Anonymous. And remember now, I'm not wanting to turn to God yet. And I go, have anyone ever been to Narcotics Anonymous? You don't have to say. Anyway, I go to Narcotics Anonymous and I sit there and what happens in the first 10 minutes? They pray. Oh no. Please let me get my life straight first. But they pray and I found out that I had to admit that there was a God, admit that I needed God. Having been raised in the church and having a knowledge of God, step three meant a lot to me. And step three simply says, number one is, step one is that you need to admit that you're powerless. Well, I was obviously pretty powerless since it's powerless since I was taking treks around the church thinking that I was going to be safe there. And step two, to admit that there was, it would take a higher power to restore my life to sanity. Well, step three was that I needed to turn my will and my life completely over to that higher power. That was, I mean, it made sense. If I wanted my life to be straight, I needed to turn my life back over to God. And that's what I did. I needed to make a complete surrender to God. And I think that this testimony will give you a lot of points that can be valid for your life. Number one, don't cheat yourself out of thinking that you can come back to God or that you've cheated him one more time because you failed him one more time. Remember that he has thrown all of your sins into the sea of forgetfulness. The only one that remembers them is Satan and he comes to remind you often. Okay. You don't need to live in the guilt of your past in any way, shape, or manner ever again because the Bible tells us there's no condemnation those that are in Christ Jesus. No reason to be guilt. We are free from that guilt. We have been liberated from that guilt. Well, I began to be involved in the church almost immediately. And almost immediately, the anointing and the call of God on my life that was there from the very beginning began to bear fruit again. And I struggled for a while and I'm trying to pinpoint, what do you want me to do, God? You're, You've had this call on my life all, all this time. You, 
you, you wouldn't let me sleep at night tormenting me that you might come back. Now I'm back. What do you want me to do? And didn't get any answers. <clears throat> Couldn't figure out what it was that I was supposed to do in God. It even came to the point to where I became so self-righteous in thinking that I could control God in my life by saying, look, you don't tell me what you want me to do. I'm done with it. Because I was so frustrated at not being able to understand what God wanted me to do and what his call in my life was all about. Knowing there was a call, but not understanding what that call was. And I know there's got to be people that, that can relate to that. I sat down <clears throat> one night and, uh, and I wrote a song about what I was feeling about this particular situation and wishing that I could understand what God wanted me to do. And sitting in my office and I was, I was reading my Bible, I had it laid out in front of me, and <coughs> I was just trying to find out, you know, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And uh, this is what he spoke to me. This is, this, this is literally what happened that night. <coughs>
basically that gave me enough strength to understand that I wasn't so big. And God was much bigger than I was. It also made me realize that he'd let me know in the right time, at the right place, what his will for my life was. And I, after maturing in the Lord for a while and being steadfast in the Lord, he began to set my feet in place and, and I began to walk in a directed path. And you know, the Bible tells us in Psalms 37 that the steps of a good man are ordered of God. Satan doesn't want you to believe that you're good men and women. Let me just ask you a little test. If I were to ask you right now, let's say that the righteousness of God is a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. If you were to think of righteousness, and 10 would be, that's God. How, where would you be? How many people in here would say, I, I, I'm a 1? Could I see hands for those of you who say, I'm a 1? How about a 2, if you're a 2, 3? Four, five, got fours and fives coming up, sixes, sevens. How many would say you're a ten? Amen. You know, the Bible tells us that you are the righteousness of God. And when God sees you, he sees Jesus Christ. And I'm just here to encourage you through this testimony that your life has not been bad enough for God to hold it against you. In fact, your life's not been bad enough for you to hold it against you. <clears throat> Only Satan wants you to believe that you need to be guilty. I now have two daughters, a beautiful Emily, who's getting ready to turn seven, and a beautiful Erica, getting ready to turn five. They both look like their mother, and they truly are from God. Very God-hearted and God-conscious. And uh, I've been a music pastor now at Grand Haven Church, Grand Haven Resurrection Life Church for two years, working a full-time job at, in Zealand. Uh, I sympathize completely with you, brother. And, but know this, God's time and God's place will happen in your life. And it's a difficult and a scary choice to leave your place of employment, to step out into the ministry. Uh, but as of July 1st, I will be starting a full-time youth and music pastor at the Animal Resurrection Life Church. And I just go back and I look at this whole thing and I understand that God's call had been there from the very beginning. And even after coming back, it was a struggle to figure it out. But it's coming to pass. And what really hit me the hardest that even after I put this testimony together a couple weeks ago in my first youth service. I shared this testimony with my youth and it never really dawned me. I thought, you know, me, a youth pastor? I don't get along well with the youth. I'm still a 70s guy in a 90s world. And as I was witnessing to them and I said, I felt the call of God on my life and began to minister youth revivals and youth meetings from the ages of 16 to 18 and it went, You've been a youth pastor all along and didn't know it. And it really touched my heart and made a difference. And I want to sing one more song to you. This has probably, probably become one of my favorite songs. And it's called Be Magnified. It's written by Lynn DeShazo. <coughs> DeShazo. And the words of this song are just so incredible. I mean, how many of you have, have sang songs and, and uh, enjoyed songs until finally one day the words that are written in that song sink in? And then, wow, it's like, whoa, I've been singing that all this time. That means so much. But I'd like to read, read this to you because I tell you what, I've got a feeling this is, this, is, this is somebody here tonight, if not all of us, at one point in our life. And it says, I have made you too small in my eyes. How many can relate? Oh God, forgive me. And I have believed in a lie that you 
were unable to help me. But now, O oh Lord, I see my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. And in my eyes and with my song, O oh Lord, be magnified. And then it goes on to say, I have leaned on the wisdom of men. I mean, you know, the Bible tells us not to lean unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Amen. the Lord. Amen. But we're kind of people nowadays, we can't see beyond this, this, this realm of the world. I've leaned on the wisdom of men. Oh, God, forgive me. And I've responded to them instead of your light and your mercy. But now, O oh Lord, I see my wrong. Heal my heart. And show yourself strong. And in my eyes and with my song, O oh Lord, be magnified. And this song finally hit me, you know, if I'm under some circumstances that are hindering me in God, I need to get out from under there. And that by magnifying God, I can be overcoming. I can be an overcomer in my life. I can overcome these things that make me lean on my own understanding. In the midst of a problem, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of affliction, simply by praising God and magnifying God, I can be an overcomer. Jesus said in Matthew, he says, to serve, he said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And he was quoting from Deuteronomy. And I went back and I looked in Deuteronomy and it said, fear the Lord and him only shall you serve. And I went, well, wait a minute. Why did Jesus say worship the Lord and him only shall you serve? Because you know, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And he took that old idea of fearing God because how many know you picked up sticks on Sunday, you were, die, you were dead. It was such a fearful thing at that time for the, the head priest to walk into the Holy of Holies that he had bells on the bottom of his gown and a rope hooked to his foot. So if he'd done one little thing wrong and he went into the Holy of Holies and died, they wouldn't hear the bells ringing and they'd pull him back out by the rope fearful thing it was to serve God. But Jesus came and he took that old covenant word fear and he changed it and he gave us a new covenant idea. Worship the Lord and him only shalt thou serve. It tells us in Psalms to worship the Lord. Worship the Lord in your need and you'll lack nothing. Actually, excuse me, it says fear the Lord. And I decided to take that old covenant word out and put the new covenant word in. And I went, you know, how many of us wait until we're out of the circumstances to begin to praise and worship God for getting us out of those circumstances? Or we wait until some great thing has happened to begin to worship and praise God and thank God for it. We need to begin to be a people of God who worship God in the midst of our problem. Amen. To begin to see ourselves above that issue. To see ourselves above that circumstance. And to begin to worship God for it right then and there. And it's like it says right here, and with my eyes and with my song, O Lord, be magnified. And I have made you too small in my eyes, O Lord, forgive me. But now, oh Lord, I see my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. And in my eyes and with my song, oh Lord, be
In closing, I want to make it a habit of my ministry to always give people an opportunity to be ministered to, to receive something from God, whether it be forgiveness, whether it be help me God be stronger in my circumstances. Or even as it says in the scripture, through weaknesses, my strength is made perfect. Better yet, boast in your weaknesses so that God's strength can be seen in you. Don't let your weaknesses be the greatest part of your life. If I could just ask everyone just close your eyes just for a moment. If there's anyone at all that would like to Hi, my name is Diane Lopez, and you've been listening to my husband, Rick, and I'd like to share with you uh, what God has done in my life. Um, first of all, I um, was raised in Lansing, Michigan. My father uh, worked in a factory. My mom stayed home with us kids. There were four of us, and we were a pretty normal family. Um, we took a lot of family vacations. We did a lot of fun things. We really had good relationships, I think. We were close and, and happy. We had unity. Um, we went to church occasionally whenever we were in town. We did a lot of vacationing on the weekends, so um, we were often out of town. But whenever we were around, my mom would take uh, myself and, and the other kids and, and um, some point in time, I accepted the Lord. I don't remember exactly when, but I was a, a child at the time. Seems like God has always been it with me uh, in my heart, but um, not in a, a real way uh, in my life until I got much older. Um, I was involved in the vacation Bible school I taught. I loved uh, being with the kids and teaching them about Jesus. I learned from them as I taught them and uh, I went on the youth canoe trips and uh, did uh, some things with the church. Not a lot of involvement um, but a little bit but at that time anyway I did um, fall in love with the Lord I think. Um, my, my childhood, again, was pretty normal. Um, going through adolescence was pretty normal. Um, being a teenager was difficult. Um, I was overweight and had really low self-esteem um, and had trouble at home like most teenagers do, but, but all in all, it was uh, uh, pretty good, I think having met other people and um, throughout my life, I've realized that my childhood was blessed. Uh, we had our problems, sure, but when I moved away from home at 18, I was really anxious to make my own rules, to um, be on my own and um, do what I wanted to do. Um, my problem was I didn't have a plan I got a good job. I had a lot of friends. Um, I really didn't have any direction for my life. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. Um, and I made a lot of wrong choices. I did, um, I got involved in, in drugs and alcohol and um, did a lot of dangerous things. Um, the Lord, I believe, was watching over me to protect me, but I only prayed when I <laughs> had made a bad mistake and really was looking for a, a way out and um, really had no direction. I know now that, um, I know so much now that I didn't know then. I. Um, 
I know that it says in God's word in Hosea 4 and 6 that uh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And when I think back on my youth, I realized that that was the case with me. I didn't have a plan. I had no direction. I didn't know where I was going or what I was doing with my life. And um, it was very difficult. The memories that I have from that period of my life are not real happy. I remember being um, alone and um, lost, really. It was like 10 years of wilderness. I, uh, I tried to determine what course my life should take, but I didn't know, and I didn't have a plan, and I didn't know that God had a plan for me. I, uh, I ended up um, in a brief marriage um, that ended um, badly. Um, it was silly, really. It was my attempt at uh, a plan, something um, stable in my life, and uh, it was a mistake. It was the, the wrong person. Um, and when that ended, after about two years, I, I really felt lost and alone then. What was I doing with my life? I didn't know. I used to have a sign in my house that said, tomorrow I'll get my head together. And the joke was, tomorrow never comes. Um, I ended up on an oil exploration crew. I spent four years traveling the western United States. I saw a lot of country and uh, It was, it was interesting. It was exciting at the time, but again, it was uh, my attempt at direction, and um, it wasn't fulfilling me in any way. After about four years, I realized that I could live anywhere in the United States, but there was only one place where my people were, my blood, and that was back here. And so I came back home to be near my family I got a, a really good job and um, bought a mobile home and um, was really trying to uh, set the course for my life, I guess. Um, and it was at that this uh, period in my life when I met Rick. Um, it's kind of funny how God works because uh, one of the things that I had learned as a child was um, a lifestyle of um, alcohol. Uh, we partied on the weekends. Uh, that, that was our lifestyle and I, I learned that and um, as a young adult I ended up with a drinking problem and um, when I met Rick uh, he was playing in a bar in a band and I was there celebrating with a friend of mine. It was the day we had closed on the mobile home and um, Rick and I um, became friends. Rick was uh, not serving the Lord at the time, and, and of course I wasn't either. I, I rarely knew God. I had a very private relationship that I depended on in my own personal way, but uh, the people around me couldn't tell. Um, I didn't know him well enough at that period of time. Um, Rick and I had a, a whirl, whirlwind courtship. Um, we fell in love and, and got married not too long after that. Um, and we decided that it was time to, to settle our lives down. I was an alcoholic, basically, and my husband had a drug problem. And uh, we were struggling. We came into our relationship with a lot of baggage. Um, we had the things that we had learned in past relationships we brought together. And it was very difficult to make a relationship work with all of that baggage that we carried. Um, right away, right away after we got married, I got pregnant, and it was it was exciting because I was uh, 29 years old and Rick was 31. We were ready to settle down. We had both been married before. Um, we wanted to start a family. We wanted to to do something um, good 
with our lives and and um, so the baby was really a blessing um, during the course of my pregnancy I quit smoking and drinking it there was it wasn't really a problem for me because I had this other life to consider and as um, irresponsible as I'd been with my own I was not going to um, threaten her life in any way it was very very important to me that my baby be healthy and uh, so I was able to stop the lifestyle my husband had a harder time he uh, his drug addiction was deeper than we had anticipated it at least deeper than I had known I didn't see everything that went on and um, when he decided to stop smoking marijuana he couldn't um, you know you we, we always thought it was something that you know you can just stop and you know the fact of the matter is it was very very difficult and I kept telling him you know if we need help we should get help because it's not wrong to, to seek out help and one day he called me from work and said okay I'll go I'll you know if we can get help somewhere I'll do it and so I called the health department I didn't know what else to do but um, they sent us to a program called access and uh, we got an appointment like the next day we went right away and the lady there spoke to us about addiction and and she talked she told us that addiction is like an iceberg and the points that stick out of the water are what you see, your drug addiction or your alcohol addiction. But underneath the water is the berg. And the things that make up the iceberg are um, shame, guilt, and fear. And uh, we could relate to that. Anyway, she recommended that we go to Narcotics Anonymous, which we did. And... Uh, um, it was it was really a good thing um, I had wanted to go to church I had told my husband you know let's go to church part of this the settling down that I wanted to do um, was to get back to uh, my relationship with the Lord although it was such a tiny thing at that time it was important to me and Rick kept saying I'll take you and drop you off but um, if we go to church we have to change and I didn't believe that. Um, in the religion that I was raised in, we didn't have to change. We, we went to church and we felt better about ourselves, but we didn't necessarily change the way we were. And so I didn't completely understand that, but my husband, he knew better. Um, Rick's father um, had been a, a Pentecostal minister and a missionary. Um, all of his life and so Rick was raised in the church and um, I knew that when I met him but when I met him he was in a uh, period of rebellion and and I, I didn't think it really made uh, a difference or that it mattered but it, it had a, a major impact it was the foundation in Rick's life that um, that we were to to build on and um, and I'm thankful that it was there um, anyway, Rick, you know, had said he was not going to go to church or go to God to get through this addiction because he had done that before. And so we decided to set off on our own and we went to Narcotics Anonymous. And um, if you've ever been involved in a 12-step uh, program, you know that the second step is to turn your life and your will over to God. And uh, it was at that point... Um, that my husband realized that God was the answer for his addiction. It was kind of scary to me because um, I had never had more than religion. I had never had a real relationship with the Lord and the charismatic people that I had seen really scared me. They were pretty fanatical <laughs> and it made me nervous. Um, but we knew that you know we wanted to change we had the desire to make a change in our life and so we we turned to the lord um we attended a small church uh actually when our baby was born um 
we, I had her on a Tuesday, and on the Sunday, the first Sunday of her life, we went to church. And when the altar call was given, we gave our lives to the Lord. And so that was really the beginning of our life in God and her life. And uh, we began attending a small church, and um, it was real small, like 30, 40 people. And um, it was scary to me because the church was alive, and I'd never been in a, a real lively church before. I remember telling my husband, you know, I'm not going to raise my hands and they can't make me. <laughs> because I didn't want to be like these people. I was open to God, but I did not want to be... Um, I did not want to mimic people. I was afraid of following a man or a woman. And I wanted to, I wanted my relationship with God to be real. And not something that somebody else had taught me, but I wanted God to teach me. I wanted Him to tell me what this whole thing was about because I wasn't, um, I didn't trust anybody else. So we began attending church, and I just really began to seek the Lord on my own, um, you know, in church and at home, and um, just reading the Word. Um, I believe that the Bible was the inspired Word of God. I believe that. I chose to believe that. And I knew that a lot of different people interpreted it different ways, but I wanted God to show me his way and so in my own stubborn way I um, decided to listen to God and nobody else and I and I think that that was good because I I spent a lot of time with him alone and I was maybe more skeptical than I needed to be in the church but um, it, that was just the only way that I could get to know him um, some of the people in the church that we were attending were real caught up in your outward appearance and I had trouble with that because I you know discussed it with God and I didn't find it in the word to be like they said and I wanted to um, I wanted to to know the truth I wanted to be obedient to God but I wanted to know his truth and not man's truth or man's um, interpretation of the word. Um, I began to pray. We prayed at this period in our life. You know, we there were so many changes taking place. We had a new baby. We had a new marriage. Um, we didn't have a lot of money. Um, it was a tough time, and God was there and and was constant and was. Um, answering prayers every day. I believe that was what really made me see. It was proof. It was the proof that I needed that God was real because I would pray and He would answer and I knew that He was hearing me. I remember being in a church service where an evangelist came and she said, she called me from the audience or from the congregation and she said that God would make me whole and that uh, ministered to me so much because God was the only one that knew how I felt inside and the uh, the voids that I had in my life. I had never, never been taught, I never knew that I was created, body, soul, and spirit. I learned that um, my spirit, there was a spiritual part of me that I had never been in touch with, that I had never known about. I fed my body too much all the time. I fed my mind, my will, and my emotions, but my spirit, man, I never, never fed. I never knew that I was supposed to. I didn't know that I was created in this way. And as I began to learn and grow, the whole spiritual side of me just, um, became so important. 
I read a book um, by Frank Peretti um, called Pierce in the Darkness, and it's a novel, but it really made me realize uh, the spiritual realm that we live in and uh, that's around us constantly and really opened my eyes to spiritual things. I just began to seek God and to, to ask Him for direction um, and answers because I had made a terrible mess of my life and uh, I wanted it to be right. Um, on August 11th, 1988, I was baptized in Lake Michigan. It was uh, August day, the beach was full, but um, the pastor had said we'd go, and I was kind of nervous. Um, but when I got to his house, half the church was there, and I didn't realize at that time what an, an awesome thing this was to be water baptized. I had been sprinkled as a baby, but I had read in the Word that Jesus had been immersed and, and um, He had said that we should also. And when I went to the beach and, and was baptized, I felt so good. I felt free. My slate was clean. My sins had been wiped away. And I felt so good, like all the mistakes and all the, um, the emptiness that I had before was gone. And I was really careful for a long time. I wanted to keep that slate clean, you know, and I didn't want to mess up. And I was really trying to be careful to, to be good from that point on. Um, I had so much joy. For the first time in my life, I felt accepted. I felt like I was okay. Um, you know, God loved me and He was able to forgive me and was teaching me how to forgive myself. He was purging me at that time of um, all kinds of junk that I had in my life. Um, I remember um, a particular thing that happened in my childhood, something that I had done that was wrong, and, and it began to just um, be in my thoughts all the time. I'd go to bed at night and I'd be thinking about this thing, and, and I knew that I had to make it right. Um, and, and God, you know, it took me a while, but I just began to pray about it, and, and you know, the Lord just really gave me the strength to go to this person and to say, you know, this I did this thing, and they didn't even know it, but I had to do it. I had to say, please forgive me, and I had to make it right. I was convicted about the things in my life that were wrong, and I needed to change them, and the Lord just gave me the strength to do that. Um, he gave me the strength to surrender myself because I was a very independent woman. When I met my husband, I had built all these walls and uh, it was difficult, even in our marriage, for me to let them go because I, I was very independent and uh, I had to do the same thing with the Lord. I had to be able to say, okay, Lord, you know, you take over and, and, uh, and he taught me. I, I began attending Women Aglow um, meetings and conventions and um, began to really spend time with people who had knowledge and in, in the Word and were able to help me and to minister to me. Um, about uh, freedom and power, the power that there was in the Lord. After being baptized, the Word just came alive to me. I could read the Bible and not read the same paragraph over and over and over and over, but I could read it and go, wow. You know, this is, I mean, I, I could understand it. I could feel it. It was alive. It, it was ministering to me. It was teaching me. And I could feel myself changing. One thing that I really want to say is that the changes that happened in my life, I did not do. God did those things in me. On my own, I could do nothing. I tried for 
20 years I tried um, to make my way and, and I failed. But when I decided to let God take control of my life, he did the, he made the changes in me. He changed me. He began to do a work in my heart and in my life where I couldn't sleep at night until I dealt with these, these, these wrongs that I had. I began to learn about obedience and obedience and submission um, to other people, um, to the Lord, to my husband, to my pastor. Um, it was hard being an independent person, being an independent woman. Uh, it was very hard to, to learn to do that, to be able to submit myself. But God gave me the strength and the ability to do that. He also taught me about um, freedom and how to uh, bind the enemy and how to uh, protect my mind and um, to take thoughts captive and um, you know all the things that I learned in the word you know God really uh, revealed to me how to make those things work in my life how to be free from um, thoughts um, I learned how you know, the, the enemy wants to um, attack me in my mind, in my, in my thoughts. And God gave me the power to overcome that. I learned in church, I learned from my pastor how to uh, rebuke the enemy and to command him to leave me alone and to take every thought captive. And um, it really gave me the power and the strength that I needed um, to change. I was able to get rid of guilt and shame and fear. And you can too. We don't have to live with these things. That if there was anything I could change about my past, it would be uh, those 10 years that I spent wandering, lost. I needed, I needed to know. I needed to know that God had a plan for my life and I didn't have to have a plan you know, we never, my family never encouraged us to go to college. Um, I'm sad about that in some respects because I wish that I had. But I had no plan. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I guess I thought that, you know, someday I would just uh, figure it out. Um, now I know that God has a plan for my life and I don't have to stumble around trying to figure out where I'm going to go and what I'm going to do because God is in control of that. All I have to do is continue to submit to Him and just um, be in relationship with Him. I realize that you know all He wants is a relationship with me. And if I stay in relationship with Him every day, He's going to order my steps. He'll take me where He wants me to go. And I'm completely comfortable with that. I've learned to trust God and to um, find peace in the fact that I don't have to have all the answers. Thank God I don't have to have the answers. God has the answers and I'll stay with Him and He'll take me through um, anything that comes my way. My husband and I are getting ready to go into youth ministry and, and it's exciting and I'm so thankful that the Lord has um, brought us to full-time ministry. It's a, an awesome thing to serve Him full-time. Um, I just hope that my testimony will help someone to find the Lord, find the guidance that they need, um, and the strength that they need to make the changes in their life. Because God does have a plan, and He will bring that plan to fruition in your life. He will complete the good work that He began in you as long as you continue to let Him.
Thank you. Well, what a blessing, Diane, for sharing how the Lord has worked in your life. And if you've been flipping channels and maybe you've tuned in late, you're not sure what you're watching, this is Precious Testimonies. You've been listening. Uh, the first part of this broadcast, Rick Lopez shared some of the uh, incredible change that God has brought about in his life, how God has become real, how God has given him purpose, and now he is walking into the fullness of God's plan for his life. Diane is falling in place uh, with God's plan for her life. She shared briefly some of the things that has happened in her life, and it has been such a blessing to see how God works in the lives of common everyday ordinary people like Rick and Diane just people you'd see out and about and God just reaches down and puts his finger on their life and says I want to use them for my glory you know God wants to use each and every one of us for his glory God has a plan for every one of our lives sometimes it's not the ministry sometimes it's just going about seeking uh, the Lord daily and how we can bring glory to him how we can reach out and help uh, struggling people. You know, there's hurting people everywhere. People put on uh, plastic smiles, but they're hurting inside. And that's what this ministry is all about, in part. Precious testimonies were here to be used of God to reach out to help hurting people. Maybe you're one of them right now. Maybe you're saying, yeah, well, it's nice for her. She's pretty, Ricky. He speaks well. He plays music. Well, I'm a nobody. I'm nothing. I'll never amount to anything. That's what uh, my mom or my dad or somebody told me when I was a kid. Well, I'm here to tell you, you are special. You know, God died just for you. He died just for you so that you might have the life of God to grasp hold of, get a hold of, get it in your life and out of your life so that you can get with God's plan. God has a plan for you, an exciting plan, not a boring plan, a plan that will bring purpose in your life. I cannot imagine any longer living life without knowing that I have a purpose from God. I have been given something from God to do in my lifetime. And if I didn't know what that was, I'd be one of the most miserable people uh, walking the, the face of this planet. And for 35 years, I walked uh, the face of this planet uh, trying to find fulfillment in a, a love relationship, in a work relationship, trying to find something that I couldn't get a hold of. And so I substituted that, like Rick, uh, with alcohol, uh, pursuing this and that, and yet it always fell short. So I'm here to tell you that if you have a void in your life if you've been as you've been listening to Rick and Diane share and maybe you've seen something in them that you don't have we're here to tell you God wants to fulfill that longing he wants to fulfill it he will fulfill it but you've got to give your all to this Jesus see Diane and Rick has purposed to give everything to God everything to Jesus and I just want to encourage you uh, as we uh, bring this broadcast to a, a close there's some things that I uh, feel that the Holy Spirit would have a share with you as I've been uh, sitting back listening to Rick and Diane share I just feel the Holy Spirit's been putting some things on my heart to share with you and um, uh, we're just going to take a step of faith and move out in that uh, before we go in another direction, I want to read just a, a very precious portion of Scripture in God's Word, the Bible, in the New Testament, in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus is speaking, his words have been recorded, and they read uh, right in the middle of uh, several uh, priceless nuggets that Jesus has left with humanity. He says, uh, John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Jesus says, I came into this world that people might have life and life more abundantly. 
Now, if you're not a Christian believer, if you're not a born-again, excited Christian believer, you can't experience that life. You have to turn your life over to Jesus Christ. When you turn your life over to Jesus Christ, you get that life and life more abundantly. But Jesus says the thief comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. The thief is Satan. He is the enemy that we're up against. And his job is to give you misery and misery more abundantly. He gives you just the opposite of what Jesus purposes to give you. Now, he'll give you substitutes and call that happiness. He'll give you drugs, alcohol. He'll give you money, fame, fortune. He'll give you uh, things of the world. that You have to do things the world's way. He'll give you sex. He'll give you all kinds of substitutes so that you call that life or happiness pleasure. But that's not the life that Jesus Christ says he'll give you. First of all, we're spirit beings with a flesh and blood body wrapped around that spirit with a soul which encompasses our emotions, uh, our will, our mind, okay? But those are secondary parts of us. Uh, the first and foremost important life that Jesus wants to give us is to get our spirits alive to God. Once your spirit is alive to God, and that can't become alive until you've connected with Jesus Christ because he is the co-creator of your spirit along with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. So the only way you can get your spirit alive is to get connected to Jesus Christ. You can't get connected to Jesus Christ until you ask him to come in and take over your life so you let him become Lord of your life. Now, as you grow in your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that abundant life becomes apparent to you. I mean, you begin to talk with God. The Bible becomes alive. God speaks through the Holy Scriptures. He does different way to bring the, has different ways to bring that life. But I feel without spending too much time on that, once you turn your life over to Jesus Christ, the spiritual warfare intensifies in your life and you will have things happen to you that the devil is doing in the unseen realm to make your life more miserable. He wants you to get uh, distant in your relationship with uh, the living God so that your uh, Christian experience is a hassle, it, it, it is uh, boredom, it is a frustration. Uh, he wants you to be frustrated so that you get distant with God, okay? That's called spiritual warfare. Now, if you really want to do great things for God, the spiritual warfare intensifies. Diane briefly shared some of that. If the devil can't snare you in drug addiction, sexual lust, perversions, pornography, um, uh, depression, uh, schizophrenia, he'll do, he has all kinds of things that he can trap you in if you're not aware that he wants to trap you, put you into bondages to different degrees. I can share personally that uh, I was a born-again Christian, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit as much as I knew how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and it wasn't until I began uh, to uh, respond to the call of God in this testimony outreach uh, we call precious testimonies as of this taping that was a little over four years ago and we begin to have Christians come in and share uh, a full-length testimony we started videotaping and playing these on public access but when my wife and I started doing that we had some knowledge of spiritual warfare but we thought we were just impervious to the attacks of the enemy and I found that uh, almost every night when I would go to bed I would start having uh, perverted sexual dreams, would have nightmares. My wife was having nightmares. By the time we'd wake up in the morning, we'd be worn out when we needed to be rested. And I know it's God's will for us to have uh, sound sleep. It's his will for all Christians to have sound sleep. And we weren't getting that. And that had never happened. I'd been a Christian for six, seven years. And uh, almost nightly, we were having these tormenting dreams. And I was asking God, take these dreams away, take them away, take them away. And they weren't going away. And I was getting frustrated with God. I was saying, God, you're God. You have the power to remove these dreams. Why aren't you doing that? And then the, uh, it, 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 the Holy Spirit brought back to mind in a time of prayer. Um, that's not how God works. I, I told you 
uh, that I gave you authority over the enemy, so you must take that authority over the enemy. And so we did what we had been taught to do uh, some months previous, and that was uh, before we went to sleep, my wife and I together, we uh, had to plead the blood of Jesus over our household and over our minds, okay? And then we had to bind all attacks of the enemy over us Every night we had to do that before we went to sleep. We couldn't pray it silently. We had tried that, nothing worked. And then I had to come to uh, realize that there were people that had been trying to teach us. They knew what they were talking about. You ha the devil can't know what you're thinking, okay? He has to hear what you say. That's, that's all that he can respond to, what you say, okay? He is not God, and he can't read your thoughts. So he had the, the, de the demon forces assigned us through Satan had to hear what we had to say. And so we had to plead the blood of Jesus out loud for those demons uh, to hear us before they could respond to that blood of Jesus protecting us. They had to hear us bind them, and we bind you devils in the name of Jesus. No plan that you have executed over us will prosper this night. We will get a good night's sleep. It's God's will for us to get a good night's sleep. We will, and we thank you, Jesus, for giving us a good night's sleep. Now, it took about two weeks for the devil to respond to that active warfare. But what I want to share with you is that there are people out there watching this tape and you don't know that the devil and his demonic forces in the spirit realm is executing uh, spiritual warfare on your mind and in your sleep and in your daytime thoughts. Whether it be, would be a, a manic depressive thoughts or schizophrenic thoughts or just depression, fear, worry, anxiety, lack of confidence, doubt, unbelief. Uh, fears of all kinds. There's all kinds of doors that the enemy works through. And he'll come on through these doors that have been opened to him a lifetime. So you think this is normal. If you're going to doctors, if you're going to secular counseling, they're going to be giving you drugs, telling you all kinds of things, but they're not going to tell you what I'm about to tell you because they don't know this. See, the devil does not want people to know what I'm about to tell you. And this is no big secret. It's just that a lot of people have not heard that once you become a Christian, now it's very important that you learn spiritual warfare so that you may have life and life more abundantly. What Jesus promised, John 10.10. 10. If, if you're not starting to move into some dimensions of joy, if all you have is a joyless Christianity, you have not been listening to the right teachings, or if you've been listening to them, you haven't been responding to them in faith and doing them, okay? You have to do. God has done all he's going to do um, in terms of spiritual warfare. Yeah, there's degrees of grace where God gives us protection. We all know that. But there's times when he will allow the enemy to come in and badger you, and you must do something about it. He's given you the power and the authority, but you must do something about it. Let me give you a little bit of scripture if this is new to you. This is totally new to you. Let's build a little bit of a foundational base here in the time we have. In the uh, New Testament, uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, uh, starting with verse 11. I'm going to read out of the New American Standard Translation. It reads, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil or Satan and his uh, demon angels, okay, demon hordes. Uh, the Apostle Paul's writing, now he's going to give you some insight into the spirit realm. And he's speaking to Christians here now, okay. This is for Christian, Christian believers. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not a bit against human beings, believe it or not. You think people are making you miserable. Well, it's the demonic influences influencing them to make you miserable, Paul saying. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. See, there's all kinds of teachings out there going around about godly angels, good angels. Yeah, God has good angels out there. 
working on our behalf, but there's also ungodly evil angels that Satan also has working on his behalf. And these people aren't telling you the whole story if they're not saying, beware of evil angels. They're not telling you that. You're not listening to the right uh, sources out there, okay? There's good and evil angels. And there's a lot more evil angels out there lurking, working in your life than you can ever know, okay? Verse 13, therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Then it goes on to tell you some things you need to do. There's some other portions of scripture tells you about binding and loosing, about pleading the blood of Jesus. Uh, you can go to any Bible believing, Bible teaching church and they will teach you about that. Uh, but you need to learn spiritual warfare. If you have mind attacks, and you can't put them to bay, you're taking tranquilizers, you're taking drugs, you're smoking uh, excessively, you're doing things to calm those voices, that is not natural. That is demonic spiritual warfare waged against you to rob your joy, your peace, if you're a Christian, to make you the most miserable Christian that the devil could possibly make you so that people would look at you and say, what do you have that I would want? Okay, so I just want to encourage you to seek God and don't let the devil box you in your little corner someplace, in your little dark room someplace, being miserable. Jesus says, I came to give life, life more abundantly. He wants you to be filled with joy, and if you're not on an increasing level, you need the knowledge and how to take authority over the demonic forces that have been waged against you because God does not want any weapon formed against any Christian to prosper. Any weapon that the devil has formed against Christians, he does not, God does not want them to prosper. He wants you to have life, life more abundantly. Thank you. I wish I had a little more time to share that, but that's just a word of exhortation. It's not God's will for you to suffer in your mind. Okay, it's not God's will for you to suffer in your mind. It's not God's will for you to suffer in your mind. Don't let anybody tell you it's God's will for you to suffer in your mind. You are to have the mind of Christ, all right? The mind of Christ is not full of depression, is not full of goofy thoughts, it's not full of torment, tormenting dreams. It's not, that is not the mind of Christ. You're to have the mind of Christ, which is to bring life more abundantly in this life, okay, in this life. Well, I want to thank you for watching Precious Testimonies. Uh, I'm Norm Rasmussen, your host. I just want to share a few thoughts with you as we bring this broadcast to a close. If you've been flipping channels and uh, maybe something has caught your interest and uh, you'd like to inquire about obtaining a copy of this broadcast, uh, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Some of the public access uh, stations that air these uh, precious testimonies will make a copy for you if you call them and ask them to do so. Some don't. Call and uh, inquire about your local public access and see what they would do if you'd like a copy. Otherwise, uh, we also offer copies uh, for those who request them, we don't charge for the tapes, although we do reserve the right to limit or delay uh, requests if it becomes necessary to do so. Uh, we've never had to do that, but if somebody called up and wanted 10,000 tapes, we'd have to trust God for the funds uh, to come up with an order that size. But we uh, do desire to accommodate people. We make it real easy for them to get copies uh, from us. There's a phone number and an address coming up shortly, so you may want to get something to write with right now. And uh, we send those out uh, free of charge. Uh, we just trust God to provide the finances to enable us to do this. And so far he has, and we're going to look for him to continue to do that in the future as long as he wants us to make the, the tapes available. Uh, we also just want to say a, a special thank you to the public access stations that do air these uh, precious testimonies uh, without them. We would not be able to bring these uh, testimonies into the privacy of people's homes. And uh, with that, I want to say uh, to God's people that I would uh, uh, 
encourage you to pray for your local public access station. Uh, there's a lot of changes in the air, a lot of uncertainties, and there's no guarantee that public access will continue to uh, broadcast uh, 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 video releases such as the ones you're just watching. Many local ministries do broadcast on them as well, and they don't have the finances to pay for uh, uh, television, and so this is just an open door at this time that God has available to local ministries such as this to play, and, and there's no guarantee that's going to continue. So uh, Christians, pray for your local public access station that God would provide finances and volunteers to make it uh, continue as it is. I just really appreciate if you would do that. Also, we just ask uh, that you would uh, be sensitive to Holy Spirit about praying that God would give us wisdom and favor to continue to take these precious testimonies out across uh, different cities across America and around planet Earth, if that's what God wills. Uh, we just want to be obedient to all we want to do is tell people that God is real, that he's alive. Naturally, we're going to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ because there's all kinds of people out there saying all kinds of things about God. A lot of people call themselves Christians. Well, we hope they are if they're calling themselves Christians, but to separate all of that, we're going to put out the Lord Jesus Christ right in front of people. You can't be neutral about the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't be neutral. Either you love him or you can't stand the name said in front of your face. And uh, we're not here to make people miserable. We're here to help people realize that the Lord Jesus Christ is one of the three persons of the Godhead, along with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He is fully God. He always was before he came down in the form of a mere man, and he's always going to be. Uh, he, there's never a time when he won't be. Yes, he was fully man for 33 years, but he was fully God in that uh, shell that he uh, called his humanity. But uh, <clears throat> having said that, we uh, just are thankful for the opportunity to let Christians come, share uh, on a casual basis what Jesus Christ has done in their life for the purpose of ministering as the Holy Spirit uh, would minister to people like you. And we open up uh, these precious testimonies to anybody who would like to avail themselves to be used of God, to have their testimony be used by Him to uh, do whatever as He would will. So if you would be interested in uh, letting us explore the possibility of uh, us filming your testimony, uh, write down the address coming up, send us a copy of your testimony, give us a call, see how the Lord would bring that about. We uh, let anybody who confesses Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, who desires to be obedient to the Word of God, who desires to be led by the Holy Spirit, you're purposing to do that, you are a potential candidate to come and testify. We don't pick from any particular denomination or local belief we believe that the body of Christ are simply those who, uh, <clears throat> the church is those who confess Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. It's not uh, belonging to an organization. It's not belonging to a church. It's not keeping a set of rules or regulations. You see, God's people in the Bible are those who desire to have a relationship with the living God. See, Christianity was never designed to be a membership it was never designed to be a religion. Christianity is a relationship with the living God. You can't have that relationship until you want to be intimate with this one called Jesus Christ. I don't care how you feel that you may be intimate with God. If you're not intimate with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're settling for something less than the very best. There is nothing better than having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I can speak that from experience. And the people that we have on here have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ to one degree or another. And it's that relationship that we want to capture and project to you. And if that's something you want, I pray that you will not let another day go by without pursuing everything that's in you everything that's in you to find out what this personal relationship with God is 
by connecting with Jesus Christ. Well, having said that, I do want to say that the views and opinions expressed on this are not necessarily any other than uh, my own. Uh, Diane and Rick's so also want to share a little bit about the ministry that uh, Rick was uh, sharing his testimony at, uh, at, excuse me, going a little too fast here, but Rick was sharing at the Full Gospel Businessmen's uh, Fellowship. That's an outreach uh, that meets once a month. It's met across the United States, actually around the world, but if you live in the western Michigan area, uh, you can contact uh, uh, the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. They meet every second Saturday at 6 p.m. at the Rock Island Restaurant. That's on M40, just south of Holland. And uh, you can contact them and come and hear testimonies such as Rick's. They have a meal at 6 p.m. and then their uh, uh, speaker starts at 7. And if you want to inquire about that outreach, it's a great, informal, relaxed time. Uh, you can call the phone number coming up and we'll let you know how uh, you can get there. It's just a great time. Also, I just want to say that um, uh, Hugo Stahl is the president of that outreach. And if you're uh, in another community uh, in western Michigan, you can contact him and he can tell you about a full gospel meeting in your local community. And having said that, now we're going to give you the particulars of how to order a copy of this broadcast and I just want to thank you for taking the time to let us share. We've tried to cram in a bunch here, at least I have and I've gone over that a little bit quickly. I wish I had a little more time but we're going to have to make that do. If you have any questions about anything I've said, feel free to call the phone number that's coming up. And if I can't answer those questions, we'll put you in contact with someone who can. Okay? God bless you. This is the information you'll want to write down if you'd like a copy of this broadcast for yourself or a copy sent to someone else. To order by mail, simply send the name and address you want this tape sent to and the tape number of this broadcast. Be sure to let us know whether you want an audio cassette tape or a videotape. The address you can write is Precious Testimonies. P.O. Box 516, Jenison, Michigan, zip code 49429. The tape number of this broadcast is tape number 229. Be sure to write that down, tape number 229. That's the only way we can identify this particular broadcast. To request a tape by phone, simply call area code 616-457-6557. A taped message will quickly walk you through the information we need to fulfill your request. Precious Testimonies is a non-denominational, non-profit ministry, and we do greatly appreciate the support of those who are helping us take these precious testimonies into the privacy of people's homes, allowing people who have not yet heard the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to hear it and to those who simply need some hope and encouragement. Remember, if you were the only person ever to be born on planet Earth after Adam and Eve, God the Father would have sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to come down from glory from heaven and die just for you. Please, never forget that. For as Holy Scripture records in Acts 4.12, maybe you've never heard this, in Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to humanity by which we must be saved. And because Jesus Christ gave his life for you, is there any greater proof of God's mercy and love for you? Is there any greater sacrifice God could have given other than himself that he could make a way for his wrath to be appeased, for sin to be forgiven, so that we can be made acceptable to God? And to think we can't earn forgiveness, we can only receive forgiveness. 
simply by our trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for it. After all, that's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't earn our way to heaven. It's a free gift. We can only receive salvation by trusting Jesus Christ for it, by his sacrificial death on the cross. God the Father longs to give each of us peace through Jesus Christ, to give rest to our weary souls, to give us spiritual life with God and spiritual life more abundantly. It starts by turning our lives over to the Lord Jesus Christ. To God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be all the glory, praise, and honor forever and ever. Thank you.